Chapter six and seven of Looking Backward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Looking Backward, two thousand to eighteen hundred and eighty seven by Edward Bellamy. Chapter six. Dr. Leete ceased speaking, and I remained silent, endeavouring to form some general conception of the changes in the arrangements of society implied in the tremendous revolution which he had described. Finally, I said, the idea of such an extension of the functions of government is, to say the least, rather overwhelming. Extension, he repeated. Where is the extension? In my day, I replied, it was considered that the proper functions of government, strictly speaking, were limited to keeping the peace and defending the people against the public enemy, that is, to the military and police powers. And in heaven's name, who are the public enemies? exclaimed Dr. Leet. Are they France, England, Germany? Or hunger, cold, and nakedness? In your day, governments were accustomed, on the slightest international misunderstanding, to seize upon the bodies of citizens and deliver them over by hundreds of thousands to death and mutilation, wasting their treasures the while like water, and all this oftenest for no imaginable profit to the victims. We have no wars now, and our governments no war powers but in order to protect every citizen against hunger, cold, and nakedness, and provide for all his physical and mental needs, the function is assumed of directing his industry for a term of years. No, Mr. West, I am sure, on reflection, you will perceive that it was in your age, not in ours, that the extension of the functions of governments was extraordinary. Not even for the best ends would men now allow their governments such powers as were then used for the most maleficent. Leaving comparisons aside, I said, the demagoguery and corruption of our public men would have been considered in my day insuperable objections to any assumption by government of the charge of the national industries. We should have thought that no arrangement could be worse than to entrust the politicians with control of the wealth-producing machinery of the country. Its material interests were quite too much the football of parties as it was. No doubt you were right, rejoined Dr. Leete but all that is changed now. We have no parties or politicians, and as for demagoguery and corruption, they are words having only an historical significance. Human nature itself must have changed very much, I said. Not at all, was Dr. Leete's reply, but the conditions of human life have changed, and with them the motives of human action. The organization of society with you was such that officials were under a constant temptation to misuse their power for the private profit of themselves or others. Under such circumstances, it seems almost strange that you dared entrust them with any of your affairs. Nowadays, on the contrary, society is so constituted that there is absolutely no way in which an official, however ill-disposed, could possibly make any profit for himself or anyone else by a misuse of his power. Let him be as bad an official as you please, he cannot be a corrupt one. There is no motive to be. The social system no longer offers a premium on dishonesty. But these are matters which you can only understand as you come, with time, to know us better. But you have not yet told me how you have settled the labour problem. It is the problem of capital which we have been discussing, I said. After the nation had assumed conduct of the mills, machinery, railroads, farms, mines, and capital in general of the country, the labour question still remained. In assuming the responsibilities of capital, the nation had assumed the difficulties of the capitalist's position. The moment the nation assumed the responsibilities of capital, those difficulties vanished, replied Dr. Leet. The national organization of labor under one direction was the complete solution of what was, in your day and under your system, justly regarded as the insoluble labor problem. When the nation became the sole employer, all the citizens, by virtue of their citizenship, became employees, to be distributed according to the needs of industry. That is, I suggested, you have simply applied the principle of universal military service, as it was understood in our day, to the labor question. Yes, said Dr. Leet, that was something which followed, as a matter of course, as soon as the nation had become the sole capitalist. The people were already accustomed to the idea that the obligation of every citizen— not physically disabled, 
to contribute his military services to the defence of the nation was equal and absolute. That it was equally the duty of every citizen to contribute his quota of industrial or intellectual services to the maintenance of the nation was equally evident, though it was not until the nation became the employer of labour that citizens were able to render this sort of service with any pretense either of universality or equity. No organization of labor was possible when the employing power was divided among hundreds or thousands of individuals and corporations, between which concert of any kind was neither desired nor indeed feasible. It constantly happened then that vast numbers who desired to labor could find no opportunity, and, on the other hand, those who desired to evade a part or all of their debt could easily do so. "'Service now, I suppose, is compulsory upon all,' I suggested. "'It is rather a matter of course than of compulsion,' replied Dr. Leed. "'It is regarded as so absolutely natural and reasonable that the idea of its being compulsory has ceased to be thought of. He would be thought to be an incredibly contemptible person who should need compulsion in such a case. Nevertheless, to speak of service being compulsory would be a weak way to state its absolute inevitableness. Our entire social order is so wholly based upon and deduced from it, that if it were conceivable that a man could escape it, he would be left with no possible way to provide for his existence. He would have excluded himself from the world, cut himself off from his kind, in a word, committed suicide. Is the term of service in this industrial army for life? Oh, no! It both begins later and ends earlier than the average working period in your day. Your workshops were filled with children and old men, but we hold the period of youth sacred to education, and the period of maturity, when the physical forces begin to flag, equally sacred to ease and agreeable relaxation. The period of industrial service is twenty-four years, beginning at the close of the course of education at twenty-one, and terminating at forty-five. After forty-five, while discharged from labour, the citizen still remains liable to special calls, in case of emergencies causing a sudden great increase in the demand for labour, till he reaches the age of fifty-five. But such calls are rarely, in fact almost never, made. The fifteenth day of October of every year is what we call muster day, because those who have reached the age of twenty-one are then mustered into the industrial service, and at the same time those who, after twenty-four years' service, have reached the age of forty-five, are honourably mustered out. It is the great day of the year with us, whence we reckon all other events, our Olympiad, save that it is annual. CHAPTER Seven. "'It is after you have mustered your industrial army into service,' I said, "'that I should expect the chief difficulty to arise, for there its analogy with the military army must cease.' Soldiers have all the same thing, and a very simple thing to do, namely, to practice the manual of arms, to march and stand guard. But the industrial army must learn and follow two or three hundred diverse trades and avocations. What administrative talent can be equal to determining wisely what trade or business every individual in a great nation shall pursue? The administration has nothing to do with determining that point. Who does determine it, then? I asked. Every man for himself, in accordance with his natural aptitude, the utmost pains being taken to enable him to find out what his natural aptitude really is. The principle on which our industrial army is organized is that a man's natural endowments, mental and physical, determine what he can work at most profitably to the nation, and most satisfactorily to himself. While the obligation of service in some form is not to be evaded, voluntary election, subject only to necessary regulation, is dependent on to determine the particular sort of service every man is to render. As an individual's satisfaction during his term of service depends on his having an occupation to his taste, parents and teachers watch from early years for indications of special aptitudes in children. A thorough study of the national industrial system, with the history and rudiments of all the great trades, is an essential part of our educational system. While manual training is not allowed to encroach on the general intellectual culture to which our schools are devoted, it is carried far enough to give our youth, in addition to their theoretical knowledge of the national industries, mechanical and agricultural, a certain familiarity with their tools and methods. 
Our schools are constantly visiting our workshops, and often are taken on long excursions to inspect particular industrial enterprises. In your day a man was not ashamed to be grossly ignorant of all trades except his own, but such ignorance would not be consistent with our idea of placing every one in a position to select intelligently the occupation for which he has most taste. Usually, long before he is mustered into service, a young man has found out the pursuit he wants to follow, has acquired a great deal of knowledge about it, and is waiting impatiently the time when he can enlist in its ranks. "'Surely,' I said, "'it can hardly be that the number of volunteers for any trade is exactly the number needed in that trade. It must be generally either under or over the demand.' "'The supply of volunteers is always expected to fully equal the demand.' replied Dr. Leed. It is the business of the administration to see that this is the case. The rate of volunteering for each trade is closely watched. If there be a noticeably greater excess of volunteers over men needed in any trade, it is inferred that the trade offers greater attractions than others. On the other hand, if the number of volunteers for a trade tends to drop below the demand, it is inferred that it is thought more arduous. It is the business of the administration to seek constantly to equalize the attractions of the trades, so far as the conditions of labor in them are concerned, so that all trades shall be equally attractive to persons having natural tastes for them. This is done by making the hours of labor in different trades to differ according to their arduousness. The lighter trades, prosecuted under the most agreeable circumstances, have in this way the longest hours, while an arduous trade, such as mining, has very short hours. There is no theory no a priori rule by which the respective attractiveness of industries is determined. The administration, in taking burdens off one class of workers and adding them to other classes, simply follows the fluctuations of opinion among the workers themselves, as indicated by the rate of volunteering. The principle is that no man's work ought to be, on the whole, harder for him than any other man's for him, the workers themselves to be the judges. There are no limits to the application of this rule. If any particular occupation is in itself so arduous and so oppressive that, in order to induce volunteers, the day's work in it had to be reduced to ten minutes, it would be done. If, even then, no man was willing to do it, it would remain undone. But, of course, in point of fact, a moderate reduction in the hours of labor, or addition of other privileges, suffices to secure all needed volunteers for any occupation necessary to men. If, indeed, the unavoidable difficulties and dangers of such a necessary pursuit were so great that no inducement of compensating advantages would overcome men's repugnance to it, the administration would only need to take it out of the common order of occupations by declaring it extra hazardous, and those who pursued it especially worthy of the national gratitude, to be overrun with volunteers. Our young men are very greedy of honour, and do not let slip such opportunities. Of course, you will see that dependence on the purely voluntary choice of avocations involves the abolition in all of anything like unhygienic conditions or special peril to life and limb. Health and safety are conditions common to all industries. The nation does not maim and slaughter its workmen by thousands, as did the private capitalists and corporations of your day. When there are more who want to enter a particular trade than there is room for, how do you decide between the applicants? I inquired. Preference is given to those who have acquired the most knowledge of the trade they wish to follow. No man, however, who through successive years remains persistent in his desire to show what he can do at any particular trade is in the end denied an opportunity. Meanwhile, if a man cannot at first win entrance into the business he prefers, he has usually one or more alternative preferences, pursuits for which he has some degree of aptitude, although not the highest. Every one, indeed, is expected to study his aptitudes so as to have not only a first choice as to occupation, but a second or third, so that if, either at the outset of his career or subsequently, owing to the progress of invention or changes in demand, he is unable to follow his first vocation, he can still find reasonably congenial employment. This principle of secondary choices as to occupation is quite important in our system. I should add, in reference to the counter-possibility of some sudden failure of volunteers in a particular trade, or some sudden necessity of an increased force, that the administration, 
while depending on the voluntary system for filling up the trades as a rule, holds always in reserve the power to call for special volunteers, or draft any force needed from any quarter. Generally, however, all needs of this sort can be met by details from the class of unskilled or common labourers. "'How is this class of common labourers recruited?' I asked. "'Surely nobody voluntarily enters that.' It is the grade to which all new recruits belong for the first three years of their service. It is not till after this period, during which he is assignable to any work at the discretion of his superiors, that the young man is allowed to elect a special avocation. These three years of stringent discipline none are exempt from, and very glad our young men are to pass from this severe school into the comparative liberty of the trades. If a man were so stupid as to have no choice as to occupation, he would simply remain a common labourer. But such cases, as you may suppose, are not common. Having once elected and entered on a trade or occupation, I remarked, I suppose he has to stick to it the rest of his life. Not necessarily, replied Dr. Leete. While frequent and merely capricious changes of occupation are not encouraged or even permitted, every worker is allowed, of course, under certain regulations, and in accordance with the exigencies of the service, to volunteer for another industry, which he thinks would suit him better than his first choice. In this case, his application is received just as if he were volunteering for the first time, and on the same terms. Not only this, but a worker may likewise, under suitable regulations, and not too frequently, obtain a transfer to an establishment of the same industry in another part of the country, which for any reason he may prefer. Under your system, a discontented man could indeed leave his work at will, but he left his means of support at the same time, and took his chances as to future livelihood. We find that the number of men who wish to abandon an accustomed occupation for a new one, and old friends and associations for strange ones, is small. It is only the poorer sort of workmen who desire to change even as frequently as our regulations permit. Of course, transfers, or discharges, when health demands them, are always given. As an industrial system, I should think this might be extremely efficient, I said. But I don't see that it makes any provision for the professional classes, the men who serve the nation with brains instead of hands. Of course, you can't get along without the brain workers. How, then, are they selected from those who are to serve as farmers and mechanics? That must require a very delicate sort of sifting process, I should say. So it does, replied Dr. Leed. The most delicate possible test is needed here, and so we leave the question whether a man shall be a brain or hand worker entirely to him to settle. At the end of the term of three years, as a common labourer, which every man must serve, it is for him to choose, in accordance to his natural tastes, whether he will fit himself for an art or profession, or be a farmer or mechanic. If he feels that he can do better work with his brains than his muscles, he finds every facility provided for testing the reality of a supposed bent of cultivating it, and, if fit, of pursuing it as his avocation. The schools of technology, of medicine, of art, of music, of histrionics, and of higher liberal learning are always open to aspirants without condition. Are not the schools flooded with young men whose only motive is to avoid work? Dr. Leeds smiled a little grimly. No one is at all likely to enter the professional schools for the purpose of avoiding work, I assure you, he said. They are intended for those with special aptitude for the branches they teach, and any one without it would find it easier to do double hours at his trade than try to keep up with the classes. Of course, many honestly mistake their vocation, and, finding themselves unequal to the requirements of the schools, drop out and return to the industrial service. No discredit attaches to such persons, for the public policy is to encourage all to develop suspected talents which only actual tests can prove the reality of. The professional and scientific schools of your day depended on the patronage of their pupils for support, and the practice appears to have been common of giving diplomas to unfit persons, who afterwards found their way into the professions. Our schools are national institutions, and to have passed their tests is a proof of special abilities not to be questioned. This opportunity for a professional training, the doctor continued, remains open to every man till the age of thirty is reached after which students are not received, as there would remain too brief a period before the age of discharge in which to serve the nation in their professions. 
In your day, young men had to choose their professions very young, and therefore, in a large proportion of instances, wholly mistook their vocations. It is recognized nowadays that the natural aptitudes of some are later than those of others in developing, and therefore, while the choice of profession may be made as early as twenty-four, it remains open for six years longer. A question which had a dozen times before been on my lips now found utterance, a question which touched upon what, in my time, had been regarded the most vital difficulty in the way of any final settlement of the industrial problem. "'It is an extraordinary thing,' I said, "'that you should not yet have said a word about the method of adjusting wages. Since the nation is the sole employer, the government must fix the rate of wages and determine just how much everybody shall earn, from the doctors to the diggers. All I can say is that this plan would never have worked with us, and I don't see how it can now, unless human nature has changed. In my day nobody was satisfied with his wages or salary. Even if he felt he received enough, he was sure his neighbour had too much, which was as bad. If the universal discontent on this subject, instead of being dissipated in curses and strikes directed against innumerable employers, could have been concentrated upon one, and that the government, the strongest ever devised would not have seen two paydays. Dr. Leed laughed heartily. Very true, very true, he said. A general strike would most probably have followed the first payday, and a strike directed against the government is a revolution. How, then, do you avoid a revolution every payday? I demanded. Has some prodigious philosopher devised a new system of calculus satisfactory to all for determining the exact and comparative value of all sorts of service, whether by brawn or brain, by hand or voice, by ear or eye? Or has human nature itself changed, so that no man looks upon his own things, but every man on the things of his neighbour? One or the other of these events must be the explanation." neither one nor the other however is was my host's laughing response and now mr west he continued you must remember that you are my patient as well as my guest and permit me to prescribe sleep for you before we have any more conversation it is after three o'clock the prescription is no doubt a wise one i said i only hope it can be filled i will see to that the doctor replied and he did for he gave me a wine-glass of something or other which sent me to sleep as soon as my head touched the pillow. End of chapter 7